Well, this morning we come to um, a little bit of respite from Hosea, um, but it's interesting that as we come to this message concerning the Holy Week before the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, we see that it very beautifully and strangely links with Hosea, what we've been studying. Indeed, most of the message of Hosea is about Israel's sin and God's coming judgment upon them. We have gotten that in large doses, including three chapters last week, right? And so this morning we come to a passage in the New Testament that is helping us see yet again the tremendous judgment of God upon our sin. In fact, all of this week, as we think about the cross of Christ, we should be thinking about Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and we should be thinking about the Levitical law, and we should be thinking about the Deuteronomic uh, recanting of the, of the law that shows us that God is holy and we are not, and there is a great judgment that comes upon sin. But even as we see that judgment, we see, listen to this, the glorious grace of God in Christ Jesus for our sins. So as Christians, as we come on Palm Sunday to this passage of Scripture that leads us into the events of Holy Week, we want God to show us well our need for Him. In fact, this morning, I've been thinking about these things, and in about 4.30 this morning, I wrote these things down as simply part of the introduction, and I want you to hear what I'm about to say. This is not on your sheet, but listen. We often need a breakthrough in our spiritual walk with God. We need a true nearness to God. We need godly spiritual victory over the battle of faith and the battle of sin, either as people who do not know God until now or even as Christians who have come to Christ. We need spiritual victory. Some are deeply struggling today and this week, and I want you to know that this passage, this message, these truths this morning could make a tremendous difference in your walk with God until you see Christ face to face. You see, this message may just be the cure for your harboring sin and the distance you have from God. As we see the majesty of King Jesus, listen, purposefully, intentionally, dramatically going to the cross, in willingly laying down his royal life, we can see his love in a way that will make us hate our unbelief and hate our apathy and hate our misplaced affections. If we simply will look to Christ and what he has done for us, we can come to hate those things that stand between us and God because his love is so lovely. As well, we see the exact opposite of Jesus in this text. We see all of the godly sacrificial love versus a devil-possessed, self-loving, world-loving fraud named Judas Iscariot. Listen. Judas' life is a horrific warning to every one of us in this room. We must properly evaluate our lives because we may very well be our own Judas. And so as we come to this, as we come to this dramatic scene during the Passover supper of the Lord with his disciples, I want us to hear and to see some things from this text of John chapter 13. If you're following along on your outline, notice at the bottom there on the page, the front page, the background and the setting of John 13. We need to remember this. Number one, four days earlier, Jesus had entered Jerusalem being hailed as king. We read that at the beginning of this service. 
from Matthew chapter 21. We see that Jesus comes in. He comes in humbly on a donkey, not a white shining horse, not a picture of power, but on a beast of burden. Jesus humbly comes in as the king who is going to suffer, much like Solomon and David who would come and be the burden of leadership for the land, but representing servant leadership of God's people. Number two, Jesus' earthly ministry of proclaiming his kingdom is complete. So he spent three years proclaiming his kingdom. He spent three years saying, this is what God is interested in. God is interested in the heart. Man looks on the outside. God looks on the inside. All the things that you've heard from Israel's history, all the things that you've heard and seen, now he is personifying And he is showing the kingdom of God to them in no uncertain terms. In fact, he's doing it with miraculous signs. Miraculous signs. He would say, look, I'm God, and the sea is calm. Look, I'm God, a lame man walks. Look, I'm God, a dead widow's son rises from the dead at his funeral. We see it on the week before he goes to the cross. He goes to Lazarus' tomb, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walks up, stands up, and shuffles to the front of the tomb. And they say, unwrap him. We see this glorious Savior King showing who he is in power. And we see some believing and some, regardless of what they see, not believing. I even this week heard a testimony from CNN of people with Richard Dawkins and others saying, well, if God would show up, like Santa on the roof, I would believe in Santa. If God would show up and do something, I would believe in him. And I know that that's not true. I know that that's not true because he did it. And there were many who never believed. So this morning we see that he, number two, he's finished the proclamation of the kingdom. And number three, it's now time, fill it in, for him to die for those he loves. He's going to die for the sins of the world. Number four, before he does that, he goes to observe Passover, or what we call the Last Supper, with his disciples. The picture of God's salvation of the nation. God's salvation of the people as they obey, putting the blood of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, on the doorposts of their house so that when the death angel passes over Egypt, the firstborn of God's people would indeed be saved from this death. And it was the picture of the sacrificial lamb that would come to save God's people from their sin. Number five, this event in John 13 occurs, what we're about to read, occurs during, maybe all caps there, during the Passover dinner. And so this is the drama in the middle of the meal. Some of you have said, yeah, we know what drama's like at, you know, holiday feasts. You wouldn't believe the drama that's happened on Christmas or Thanksgiving or something at our house. Well, this is drama like you've never seen as the royal Messiah King is betrayed by a devil-possessed hater of truth. There are five key persons in this passage. There is, of course, Jesus, and we see Peter, Peter who often is in everybody's business, John, who quietly is right next to the Lord. John, who refers to himself in his own book that we're going to read as one of the ones whom Jesus loved, part of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. John, often not proclaiming himself loudly, referring to himself in the third person, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It was no secret that Jesus was very, very close to a few of them, and John being very close to the Lord. But then there was also Judas that we're going to read about. Judas, one of the 12 disciples, 
Judas, the one who was trusted enough and apparently had the reputation enough that he was entrusted with the money. I mean, they didn't give it to Bartholomew. They didn't give it to Matthew. They didn't give it. I mean, Matthew was a tax collector. He'd take his own, perhaps. I mean, you know, what was in their minds about all that? Well, Judas, we'll give it to Judas. He's, he's trustable and he's diligent. He takes care of details. And then finally, let's not forget Satan. Because this great and glorious titanic struggle over the salvation of the world would be there. Satan only given a chance to do God's bidding and to do God's work so that he may bring salvation to the world. Satan on his leash that God holds in his hand. Would you see the passage that we're at? John chapter 13 and verse 21 Much of the book of John is all about this evening and things that Jesus said at this dinner. But here we come to part of the actual dinner time. And notice here in verse 21, and after saying these things, Jesus, you see that's bold there, that's one of the five, Jesus, notice what it says, was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. You see, they didn't automatically suspect Judas. In fact, Judas may have been one of the last ones that they suspected. Verse 23, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, that's John, referring to himself in the third person, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at the table at Jesus' side, so he was close to Jesus. Verse 24 So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Now, there's a little bit of comedy that's allowed here. This is humorous. If you really study the New Testament a little bit and you learn about Peter and you see what all Peter would do in his life and over those three years of Jesus' ministry, Peter was always the one who's, who's, who's just really full of energy and he's always the one who's really exuberant and he speaks while his mind is not fully engaged. In fact, sometimes he does things that are filled with faith and zeal but yet he gets himself in trouble. I mean, he jumps out of the boat, sees Jesus, walks on the water. Well, nobody else walked on water, but as soon as he gets his eyes off Jesus, he begins to sink and says, Lord, save me. Peter was filled with passion. And so being a little distant from Jesus, perhaps across the table, he's going, (laughs) ask him, who is it? Sorry for those of you who are listening by audio. It doesn't work. Um, but he's, he's pointing to John. Going, ask him, ask him. We see this. Look at verse 24. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus who he was speaking of. Verse 25. So that disciple, that's John again referring to himself. So that disciple leaning back against Jesus said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. Verse 27, then after they had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, because the feast would continue, is the idea, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And it was night. So Judas is dismissed early to go do what the Lord Jesus knew all about. And Judas, knowing that Jesus knew this, goes on and does it anyway. Judas, who had been present, seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. 
goes to sell out the Savior. And before we think too harshly of Judas, we need to realize that Judas could be us. First of all, let's remember, flip your sheet over, number one, you're really listening this morning because usually you flip the sheet over and I have to tell you not to and everything else. So, notice number one, notice that, Jesus, that John's closeness to Jesus is, is great. There is this closeness to them, and there's many passages that we could go to and look at this, but, I mean, there's a few clues of how, how good and, and close their relationship is, and we can see this with Peter, James, and John, but we especially see it with John right now. In verse 23 and in verse 25 from the other side, you would see that it says, one of his disciples whom he loved, or leaning back against Jesus. So this is, this is the guy that's right there next to to Christ. You just may want to make a note here. It's very good to be near to Christ. Amen. It's very good that we stay close to the Savior, and not just in physical proximity, but it's very good that we keep our hearts near His heart. Look at John chapter 21, verse 24 on your outline. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. So John is writing about himself. This is the disciple who's bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. So John is, he is saying, I've written this so that you can believe who Jesus is. I was close to him. One of the reasons that John talks about his nearness, listen, one of the reasons that John talks about his nearness to Jesus and the fact that Jesus loved him is that John wants you to know that you're getting the inside scoop when you read the gospel of John. You're getting the close perspective, the one who is near to Jesus, and it was obvious to all so that when his written testimony comes out years later, that many people would say, well, John said it, and I know enough about John, and that John was there, and John saw, John heard everything. And so we see that this is all about you believing the gospel of Jesus, that's why John is simply saying the disciple whom Jesus loved. This intimacy with Christ is so much God's design. And those who come to know this intimacy come to become addicted to this intimacy and desire this intimacy and continue in this intimacy and continue to serve the Lord who has given them commands because of his great love. But not only do we notice John's closeness to Jesus, but we also need notice in this passage Jesus' commitment to God's sacrificial plan. My friends, Jesus didn't go into Holy Week wavering. Scripture tells us that he set his face as flint. He set his face direct to Jerusalem, going to Jerusalem, fulfilling the ministry of God, knowing that he was going to lay down his life for God's people. And so this, this whole chapter plainly reveals these things, letter A, that Jesus was resolved even amidst great pressure, betrayal, and dread. He was resolved. Why do I say that? If you look at verse 21, he says, after these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, there's several places in, in the New Testament where we see that Jesus was troubled and that Jesus was an emotional being, an emotional God. We have a God who is passionate and emotional. Just, just read the Psalms, and you can see the passion of God in the Psalms, and he's made us to be passionate people. And so this Jesus was not an unfeeling God that is unaffected by not only his work within us and his, and his life with us. He's deeply affected. He deeply has passion. He deeply has concern. And even in his going to the cross, we see on the, in fact, just a, perhaps a few hours later, 
that Jesus would be there sweating drops of blood over the agony of what is about to happen between God the Father and the Holy Spirit and God the Son as Jesus is going to become our sin on the cross. A holy God taking sin upon himself. There is no greater cataclysmic event than this. That holy God would take sin upon himself. And so Jesus is resolved amidst the trouble of this and amidst the betrayal. Look at the next part, letter B. Jesus was deliberate to prove his plan. He is deliberate in this. If your Bible is open to John chapter 13, this is, this is also there, and we see that Jesus in verse 18 is saying, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the Scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. And so Jesus is saying, the prophecy that is declaring that there is one who is not only going to fight me being Satan, but also this picture of Judas being used by Satan to fight against him, Jesus is saying, you will one day understand that I indeed am the Messiah that's coming to pay for your sins. And he's deliberate to prove it. So Jesus is not going to the cross wondering what's going to happen as modern theologians of popular classical liberalism would have you believe. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he went to the cross to pay for your sin. Let us see. Jesus was intent to see it all the way through. Jesus was intent to see it all the way through. In verse 27, we read that then after he had taken the mortal morsel of bread, Satan entered into him. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. You see, there was no wavering. There was, there was no delay. Jesus was like, bring it on. Let's get this done. I have spoken my love. Now I'm going to show my love in a way that you will never fully understand until you see me face to face. Let's do it. Judas, don't delay. My friends, that's love. That's love that says, all that you've ever done against me, I am going to pay for it with my own righteous life. What you do not deserve, I'm going to give to you for those who will receive it. Wow. You see, this is commitment. This is commitment to God's plan for us. And Jesus did not waver. Number three, notice Judas's covert complicity to Satan's scheme. Notice Jesus's covert complicity. I mean, no one knew what was going on. He had them all fooled. He looked good, smelled good, he was on time. He changed diapers in the nursery when he was asked to do that. He fixed the toilets. He built the ramps and going into elderly's homes. I mean, he, he was the Johnny on the spot. He was the guy that was ready to help. He was entrusted with the money. We see that in verse 2 of John 13... It says, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You see, this is, this is what opens this moment of drama from John 13. We see that Satan 
is working in Judas, and Judas is complicit. We see that others had been tempted, and others even failed, but they had come back over and over again to Jesus, not in their rebellion, but in their godly repentance. But not Judas. In verse 10, it says, Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not every one of you. You see, Jesus is, is showing us that, that Judas, as we can see now in hindsight, was not one of them. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. That's 10 and 11. Now, I want you to see this and fill this in. Judas was known as a disciple of Jesus. I mean, my goodness. He was one of the people that would have been identified as his disciples. He was one of the ones that was always there, walking, always there, talking, always there, serving, always observing. But we also see in this text that Judas was a fake and a fraud. He wasn't the real thing. He was a phony disciple. And how do we know this? It's proved by what he ultimately does. Much we would see that no one knew. Judas was self-deceived and a deceiver of others. Judas was self-deceived and a deceiver of others. Now, friends, as we come as Christians in 2019, or perhaps as church attenders in 2019, as we come to Holy Week, it is important that we take seriously what we recognize during Holy Week. What do we recognize during Holy Week? We recognize Christ as King coming to lay down His life. We recognize that the cross of Calvary is the place where all of God's wrath against the sin of His children is poured out on Himself in order to display His love. And so, it would be right that we evaluate our lives. We see that the Scripture tells us to evaluate our lives. This Friday evening, when the table is set for the Lord's Supper, it is right that every one of us come to this place to remember His death. It is right that every one of us come to this place and say that this table is set to remind us that God is a God of love, but He's also a God of judgment and wrath. And He pours out His wrath upon Jesus, and that all who trust in that sacrifice can be forgiven and brought into life. It's important that we examine ourselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27, this is on the outline, and we often read this when we observe the Lord's Supper. And we read this because the Corinthian church did not take seriously the table of the Lord. There were all kinds of things going on in the Corinthian church. Listen to this, ongoing sin in the Corinthian church. So it wasn't just that some people were getting drunk. It wasn't just that some people were, you know, the poor people are given a bad place at the table and the rich people are given a good place at the table. All this crazy partiality that just goes against the heart of God. It, it's not just that, but it's about their lives being lived out during the week in the city and in the, in the hillside, in the countryside, here in South Florida. It's about their lives being fraudulent. And so we're told, examine your life. 
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 on the screen in front of you. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, that's, that, that's with, without recognizing what has been done, who has given his life, and how you're living your life. Without discerning, the body eats and drinks what? Judgment on himself. In verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some of you have died. Verse 31, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, look at this, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the, Lord, the world. This is a glorious reminder of what we're seeing in Hosea. In Hosea, we're seeing that God's people are being called to come and repent. Israel is being called to come and repent of their sins. And some of them do, and many of them do not. And Isaiah is there, or Hosea is there, proclaiming this judgment that is going to come upon them. My friends, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Let him discipline you. Let him show you where you're wrong. Let him bring you to his side. In fact, we also see and so if you haven't filled it in already, examine yourself. That's what 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight 28 through 34 says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, after the Corinthian church was doing much better, we see that he is saying to them, test yourselves. And look at the screen in front of you. Here's the passage. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? You see, a true Christian continually comes before God in his flesh and says, Lord, am I in you? Show me that I am in you. And the beautiful thing is, is that his spirit will bear witness with our spirit that we are indeed his, if we indeed are his. But our actions will show whether or not we obey him. We don't do the right thing because we want to be saved. We do the right thing because we are saved. And this is the picture of what it means that we would continually come before the Lord in this life and say, Lord, am I yours? I believe that you can know that you are his. 1 Corinthians 5.13 says that these things have been written to you who believe in Jesus as the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. It's not that you cannot know, you can know. But a wise Christian continually comes before the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 2, 3, 4, 6, we see this warning. And I want to encourage you to spend time and allow the Word of God to warn you that you would be in him, that your faith would be in him and not in anything or anyone else. In Hebrews chapter 10, this is a glorious passage, and I would encourage you to spend time in Hebrews chapter 10 this week as we look at the picture that God calls his people to go on with him and not on with the world. And so we see this comparison, fill this in, of Peter and of Judas. We see a comparison of Peter and of Judas. You see, one received and believed the words of life, even in his mess-ups, even in his failures. He, he believed and he received the words of life. The other one rejected and ultimately hated the words of life, setting himself against them and ultimately betraying them. You see, Judas's covert complicity to Satan's scheme should be a true warning 
that we would say, boy, there's, it's possible to look good. It's possible to be part of the inner crowd and be self-deceived or simply deceiving everybody else. Finally, I want us to see, and this is where we tie in again this message to the nation of Israel through Hosea. Number four, like ancient Israel, in Hosea's day, Judas, Judas loved the world instead of loving God. That's ultimately what we see in his life. Perhaps he loved being with this rebel rouser preacher. Perhaps he loved people seeing him with him. But we know that he would come for 30 pieces of silver to receive payment for deception and betrayal. You see, Judas loved the things of the world more than he loved God. And it's possible that we can ultimately love the things of the world more than we love God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we see the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy very often about preachers. And there's an aspect of this that is about false teachers and false deceivers um, that would come into the church, but it's also about people in general. This can apply to anyone in the modern church. Look at verse 1, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, wow, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Verse 3, heartless, unappeasable. That means they can't be appeased. They're unsatiable. They're slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, verse 4, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. And look at this, I've underlined it for your outline. Lover, let's read it out loud together. What does it say? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So verse 5, having the appearance of godliness. Is this not Judas? But denying its power. You see, as we come to Holy Week, there should be a very heavy, heavy remembrance of the price that Jesus would pay for us and our call to love him and his kingdom for his great love and the seriousness of his judgment that he took upon himself, that we may go free. Amen. Thin Christianity only rejoices really in Easter Sunday, very often while skipping over Good Friday. For some, Christ is still on the cross, never really recognizing the resurrection. For others, it's just the emotional exuberance. Oh, God is a God of grace. Aren't we all glad? And it, they wouldn't say it, but they would perhaps practically live it. God loves to forgive, and I love to sin. We got a good deal. We see Scripture warns us against that, that our lives are called to be genuinely before the Lord. You see, Judas is a cautionary, not tale, but warning to us. Judas' life is a cautionary warning to Sheridan Hills Baptist Church and to the people who have stumbled in this morning, first time here. Sorry to have such a double barrel at you this morning as well, but this is the gospel that we are called to see what Christ has done for us and to not take it lightly. We are called to live differently because of what Jesus has done. It is a cautionary warning. And so what we would do well is to evaluate ourselves. 
I want to encourage you this week to set aside this week to evaluate your life. To say, am I truly a Christian? Does my life reflect the life of Christ? Would you stand with me for prayer?